which was corrected, but I had a note to myself here that said JY Park here. Uh, Park Jin Young came and gave a talk to the students at, at Yonsei University. And one student asked if he tried to put, oh, I'm sorry, if any of you don't do, does everyone know who JY Park is? Park Jin Young? Most, most of you know. It's a famous Korean entertainer who's basically working now in America, or was until very recently, and in, in sort of rap and, and R&B genres. And one of, one of the young students asked him, do you deliberately try to inject some Koreanness into this otherwise, you know, basically African-American musical genre? And he gave a perfect answer. He said, no, he doesn't, but he, does, he doesn't try or not try. He simply creates music, but he, he made the very important point that even if he tried, consciously tried to avoid putting in any Korean elements and somehow make this uh, a pure copy or 100% or, or you know, American, you know, African-American genre, it would be impossible because he was raised in Korea and these things are going to come out when he creates. And I, I would make the same arguments about literature. It's not really necessary to try to put Korean elements in. Um, they, they will simply be there, although yeah, increasingly in the 21st century, I think not in the sort of uh, stereotypical and easily recognizable forms that they took in the past. Um, so despite the narrow conceptions of, of what constitutes Korean literature among some of those in the literary establishment, a growing number of young Koreans are not waiting for the perfect translator. Rather, they are writing in English. I'm not talking about having pen pals or winning foreign language essay contests. I'm talking about South Korean citizens writing excellent literature in English. Some may consider this a sort of self-translation, and in some cases it may be. It depends completely on the individual writer. By the same token, however, for some Koreans, writing in Korean may also uh, actually be an act of translation. Kim Dong-in is acknowledged as one of the greats of early modern fiction and has a literary prize in his name, but he reported that when he first, that he first thought of his stories in Japanese, then later translated them into Korean as he wrote them. Uh, he even went so far as to write that conceiving of them in Japanese, he had, this is a typo, he had no problem, but trying to find the right words in Korean, sorry, another typo, was quite difficult. Yet no one questions the Koreanness of his literature or the prize in his name. A similar case held true for those pre-modern Korean intellectuals who opted to write in Korean. Literary Chinese was the language in which they read and wrote the vast majority of their literature. To compose in Korean would largely have been an act of translation. In Korea, past, present, and future, there is absolutely no room for exclusively racial or linguistic definitions of liter literature's citizenship, which leads me to a discussion of blurring the line between Korean and foreign. And these are obviously deliberately put in quotation marks. As alluded to above, the idea of a narrowly circumscribed national identity is a relatively recent phenomenon throughout the world. In Korea, such definitions really did not congeal until the early 20th century. Pre-modern distinctions were made not so much between categories of Korean and non-Korean as they were between civilized and barbaric. Whether one was civilized, and thus included, was based on the acceptance of a common culture which depended on a large degree on, on written language. As such, all educated Koreans were at least bilingual and bicultural. There is a historical naturalness to multilingualism and to multiple harmoniously coexisting identities. In fact, the nearly schizophrenic approach to language, culture, and nationality briefly exhibited in, the late, 20th, in late 20th century Korea may be directly linked to the cognitive dissonance that arises when trying to cope with the narrow-minded, nationalistic demand for an artificial unity of these things. Delving into Korea's past, we find that cosmopolitanism and multicultural, or multilingualism and multiculturalism were quite natural. Um, the Shilin scholar uh, and official Che Chiwon was sent to Tang China uh, at a young age with orders from his father either to pass the civil service examination or not to return. Che succeeded and went on to a successful career as both a Tang military and civil official before returning later to Shilla. Buddhist monks from the Three Kingdoms period and the Korea dynasty uh, traveled, studied, and sometimes settled in China and India. They identified not only with their own languages, but also with the transnational languages of literary Chinese and Sanskrit, as well as the transnational culture of Buddhism. By the Chosun dynasty, Neo-Confucianism had supplanted Buddhism, 
but the ability of its language and culture to transcend national borders remained a constant part of Korean society. And finally, none of these exchanges were unilateral. Korea also hosted, temporarily or permanently, Buddhist monks from China and India, military generals from Japan and China, and many others. Their common civilizations and their written culture were sufficient to unite them. All of this began to change as Koreans were simultaneously exposed to pressure and threats from abroad and to nationalism. Even under Japanese colonial rule, however, most educated, educated Koreans accepted the fact that bilingualism had been and would continue to be a fact of life on the peninsula. The only difference was that Japanese, and English for many, had replaced literary Chinese as the language to master. The truly significant shift came in 1945 with Korea's liberation from Japan. The generation that came of age after 1945 was the first in over a thousand years to believe that monolingualism and monoculturalism were both natural and sufficient. Although the nationalism of this period was both a somewhat natural post-colonial outgrowth and a factor in South Korea's later reconstruction and development, its utility was relatively short-lived. By the late 1990s, it had essentially already been judged by the South Koreans themselves as being obsolete. On the national level, as South Korea became a major producer, not only of ships and automobiles, but also of culture and art, Insularism and xenophobia became hindrances to further development. On the individual level, South Koreans outpaced the government and began pursuing bilingualism and biculturalism on their own. I should, uh, another quick aside, being at, being at UIC, which is uh, uh, an all-English, primarily English-based undergraduate college at Yonsei University, we're getting these students. They're returning to Korea, um, and they many of them have simply opted out of the Korean education system. Their, their, their parents, uh, the parents and or the students are simply not satisfied uh, with, with what's happening here, and so they've, they've sort of uh, gone ahead of the government. Um, I know there, there is a lot of controversy surrounding uh, email box various plans for, you know, driving the, the sort of <laughs> foreign language high schools down to junior highs and junior highs down to elementary schools and things. Uh, but. It, it, it may as well happen in Korea because if not, all these people are just going to, to America or Canada and to, to a large, uh, a, a large, a quickly increasing degree, even, even China and Southeast Asia to international schools. Um, I recruit at these schools uh, high school students to come to UIC and, and they've actually put a limit all over Southeast Asia. There's actually a limit on Korean enrollment, usually at 30%, because if they don't limit it, they'll have 50 and 60 and 70 percent of the entire school will be Korean. So it's 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 a it's a, it's an established fact. It's just that it's it's happening outside of Korea's borders. But it's it's Korean parents and students who, who are doing this without uh, the government. Um, so be, back to to my paper. By the beginning of the 21st century, the results of this trend became unequivocal. South Koreans understood the need for bilingualism and were expressing that understanding with their own feet and wallets. In 1995, there were 1,200 middle school students studying abroad. In the year 2000, the number rose to 1,799, not an enormous increase. The real leap came when the number essentially quintupled over the next five years. 9,246 South Korean middle school students were studying abroad in 2006. As can be inferred from the numbers above, this trend is growing stronger over time. In keeping with this, it is actually the numbers for primary school students that show the greatest changes. Maintaining the dates used above, in 1995, there were 235 primary school students studying abroad. By 2000, the number had basically tripled to 705. Only six years later, in 2006, the number had reached 13,814. Put another way, the number of South Korean primary school students studying abroad was more than 58 times greater than it had been only a decade earlier. The numbers for high school and university students, of course, are also quite high and also rapidly increasing. The result is that South Korea, despite its relatively small population, has been the country sending the largest number of foreign students to the United States for the last two years running. And it is not only the United States, there are large numbers of South Korean students in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Great Britain, nor must we limit discussion to primarily Anglophone countries. South Korean students are also disproportionately represented in international schools throughout Asia. What all of this means in con concrete terms is that, although there are already significant numbers of bi and multicultural or multilingual South Koreans, their numbers will only grow. Yet even now we are seeing the effects of the first wave of this phenomenon. Yonsei University's Underwood International College, it's a four-year liberal arts college taught completely in English. Approximately 70% of UIC students, however, are South Korean nationals. 
UIC is also unique in that it offers a creative writing program with courses in fiction, poetry, and literary translation. The students from this program, after only a year of training, are already producing publishable works in English. But the great majority of them are writing Korean literature. As discussed above, the nationality of literature cannot be decided by the language in which it is written. The young writers of whom I speak are citizens of the Republic of Korea, attend university in Seoul, and generally consider themselves Korean, albeit not in the essentialist terms of many of their predecessors. Put another way, if they are Korean nationals and they are writing in Seoul, how can their literature not be classified as Korean? All of that said, <clears throat> unless some more traditional readers arrive at an erroneous conclusion, the nationality of literature also cannot be decided solely by the ethnicity of the writer. Just as many Koreans are opting to study abroad, so are an increasing number of non-ethnic Koreans being educated in Korean schools. South Korea is now a quite wealthy country and it is attracting migrant workers from throughout Asia. The children of these workers most often attend Korean public schools, making them into native speakers and writers of Korea, raised and socialized in Korea. An even greater number of domestic Korean students, particularly in rural areas, come for marriages between a South Korean male and a Southeast Asian female. They are legally South Korean citizens and included on their father's family registry, but they are not the culturally and racially pure Koreans of the generation. <laughs> Members of both of these groups, however, very much have the potential to write Korean literature, this time in the Korean language. Uh, Cheng Rui Lee's works are very much American literature, so what should we call the works of an, ethic, an ethnic Bangladeshi, for just one possible example, who was born in Korea, undergoes all 12 years of mandatory schooling in Korea, perhaps continuing on to a Korean university, and eventually writes fiction and or poetry in perfectly native Korean. Although I consider the above question rhetorical, uh, actually, I consider the above question rhetorical. The more interesting question for us here today is, what does all of this have to do with the KLTI and translation? Well, we may be cutting out the middleman, as it were. Many Korean writers won't need translators. They will be writing in perfect English, just as they did with literary Chinese for over a thousand years. This will make Korean writers and their, their literature immediately accessible and more universally appealing, just as they were in the pre-modern period. It will not, however, make them any less Korean. We should remember here the discussion above of Yi Guang Su and the debates over pre-modern Korean literature at the beginning of the 20th century, and how they were finally resolved in favor of inclusivity. Somewhat ironically, however, we may need translators to put Korean literature written by non-ethnic Koreans into English often coming from less socioeconomically privileged, from a less socioeconomically privileged background, they are much more likely to go through the Korean public education system and hence to write in Korea. Although this will make them uh, less immediately accessible to the outside world and happily guarantee that there will still be a place for the KLTI and for translators, uh, it will also enrich Korean literature, making it more diverse and pluralistic. Their stories will likely be different from those of the previous generation, perhaps more focused on individual struggles and issues. Ironically, this will also make them more universal and accessible to those outside Korea. Many Koreans insist that it is a lack of excellent translators that has kept them from winning a Nobel Prize thus far. I, however, would argue that it is a lack of stories that translate, irrespective of language. That is, so many of the stories revolve around specifically Korean problems and concerns, and hinge upon a knowledge of and interest in particular issues in Korean history that they are simply unappealing to all but a small minority of non-Koreans. Whether we think of someone like Chang Rae Lee or Philip Roth, some of the finest examples of American literature were written by first and second generation immigrants as they came to grips with issues such as their own hybridity, their own lack of clear lines of distinction, and their own relationship to two or more different linguistic and cultural spheres. It is exciting to realize that South Korean literature perhaps possess, possesses even greater literary potential. Like the United States, it now has a first generation of bicultural immigrants poised to write a new Korean literature in Korean. Unlike the United States, that most monolingual of countries, it also possesses a large number of bilingual ethnic Korean citizens who are already writing Korean literature in English. And these two new strains of Korean literature, each in its own way, contain the potential to enrich significantly modern Korean literature by opening new possibilities and attracting new readers. Thank you.
음, 그 정체성에서 너무 그 편협하게 그 칸막이 벽을 치지 말고 어쩌면은 